You know, the war in Ukraine is very um, still uh, continuing since February. It's a leak uh, or a, it's a sign of weaknesses of us as progressive forces because we are split it. Particularly, I will speak about European left. There was recently a um, conference, today's conference of Transform Europe in Athens. So there's a polarization in politics. I think there's no need for the left to speak on behalf of Putin. And I don't think there's a need to speak on behalf of Zelensky. I don't think there's no need for us to speak on, Joe, on behalf of Joe Biden or Jens Stoltenberg. So this polarization is weakening the, the, those who can be helpful to the people of Ukraine. I mean, uh, it's clear Russia occupied another country. This is illegal. So this is against international law. There's no excuse for Turkey or Russia to occupy foreign territories. Uh, so that, in that we have to be clear. There was some say, well, yeah, Putin was forced to do this. No, Putin had also other options. But because he is thinking about great Russia, like Erdogan is doing great, uh, uh, great Turkey, and occupying is not a part of self-defense. I reject this uh, excuse, excuse, which is used often. And uh, I feel sorry for the people of Ukraine because uh, I, because uh, they have played a um, wrong game and made their country to buffer zone in between a power sharing conflict between two states, the US and Russia. So the result is millions of refugees and hundreds of thousands of killed people. You see, therefore, it's important to have in, in, in for us as progressive forces to have a clear view on the issues. We have to describe ourselves as the third power. It's not our duty to take part for the hegemonial, for those who are conflict, who are in conflict because of power sharing. So, and I think uh, this process is challenging us to come to understand uh, there's no, when you look in the German left party, they're getting weak because they are split it now. But we have, uh, uh, they could also play a role to bring the mass movements saying, we are on the side of the peoples. And if there's a progressive power in Ukraine, we should support them. Why do we support direct or indirectly Putin or uh, NATO? So this is not our duty. And I must say as a Kurdish, we have uh, always bad experiences with Russian state policy. And since we are speaking about Iranian Kurdistan, in 1946, the Kurdish Republic of uh, the Republic of Kurdistan in Mahabad was uh, supported by the Soviets. And then later on, after they agreed with the British, so they let the Kurds down and then the Iranian regime killed all of them. And then we have seen also the Russians role in uh, offering Turkey the security city of Afrin in Rojava in 19, 20, 1918. So I would say from, the, from our perspective as Kurdish, the Russian policy was always anti-Kurdish until today. And as you see, when the NATO has a conflict with, the, with Turkey, Putin is uh, making use from the opportunity supporting Erdogan. He, he is not interested in the life of the Kurds or democracy, whatever. And also uh, Joe Biden is doing the same. So we, have, we don't have good experience with the US at all. So after Putin gave offered Turkey the Kurdish cities uh, of Afrin, Trump offered Turkey Serikani and Gerisipi in Northern Syria one year later in 2019. So for us, it's becoming clear to be the third power. So I think we have to describe this. What, what does it mean for all of us, uh, the third power, uh, looking at the progressive elements in country, even if they're weak, we have to strengthen them. Uh, this is our position uh, regarding Russian-Ukraine uh, war, and I see, I see, I think in the in, in the next time there will be a ceasefire because they achieved to weaken Russia militarily. It seems like, and I'm sure Putin will give some come to some compromises because um, uh, they can't survive with the pressure of all the nations of the states uh, of the NATO. So um, even the even Russia is backed by China and Iran, uh, but uh, it seems like this. And then what will happen then afterwards? 
So this is the other question we have to ask. I, I'm, I'm not, I don't say that when Russia becomes big, the U.S. will bring a democracy property in the region. No. Uh, you see, I, I say this because many of wars will come in this century, and we need to define ourselves from new with the progressive forces. For whom are we staying? For whom we are speaking? Uh, so that I would um, say from my perspective. Well, uh, concerning Iran, I would say there's a trap and we have to be very careful. Uh, there's one side, uh, there's a the, the, in the NATO summit, uh, Iran was declared as a hostile force, as an enemy. So the conflict between the NATO, the US, Iran is a conflict of interests. So of course the US don't the US is not interested to have a system change in Iran, Iran but regime change. So because the system of the nation state of Iran is for the benefits of the nation state of the US and others because it's based on denial of diversity. It's a system which is anti-democratic. The peak is just this new form of the mullahs. So they're representing in different forms and methods, but it's a state based on anti-democracy. So the, the struggle between, or the conflict between the US and Iran is not for democracy. It's for um, uh, offering uh, or opening the gates for new liberalism over Iran. So that's why regime change is needed for the interests of the NATO. But there's another part, uh, which is uh, interesting for us, which is the strategic area. Uh, these are the people's uprisings in Iran, led by the women's uh, women in Iran. So we, uh, first of all, I think uh, system change in Iran needs the unity of progressive forces in Iran. And since the Kurds are playing a central role, uh, the Kurdish women are playing a central role in Eastern Kurdistan, I mean, uh, Iran occupied part of Kurdistan. So there's a need, a huge solidarity with the Kurds. So uh, let's say if they want a system change, then those who, who are able to do this are the Kurds because they are organized, well organized, they are politicized people. And what is much more important is the main uh, political player in Iran, in Iran, in Kurdistan is Peja, the Free Lives Party. And it has the thousands of fighters. So, uh, so then the people who are planning for uprising, they have also defense forces. Because Iranian regime, we have seen in the last days, they have killed hundreds of people. So if, the if you want to, to be taken serious by the regime, you have to firstly organize uh, mass movement. Secondly, you need defense forces. This is the truth of Middle East. But, um, uniting the people, all those who want the system change, for each of the components is important to overcome nationalism. So most, mostly I would suggest our uh, Persian ethnic identities to give up this nationalistic um, ideology. Being more open for the Kurds, for the Baluch, for the Ahwas, for the Azeris in Iran, because Iran is a multi-ethnic and multicultural state. You see, we have the problem also in Turkey. We say to the Turkish progressive forces, people listen, we are the, now the leading force of, of the revolution dynamic inside of Turkey. And the Kurds can't be, can be the dynamic if they're protected by their own defense forces, which are the guerrilla fighters in Northern Iraq, in, in northern Kurdistan, in, in Rojava. So if, for example, the Turkish army is using chemical weapons, then they will, if they achieve, if, can they, if they can achieve the goal, then we are the next, the Kurds are the next. Please shout, say no, no to the use of chemical weapons. I would say, and now because of the nationalism amongst the Turkish progressive, uh, so-called progressive forces, we are fighting against the regime by our own. Of course, there are some groups from the ter Turkish left, revolutionary movements, but we need them to organize also the Turkish uh, society. So the same, not to repeat the mistake happening in Turkey. So there's a need for Iran 
in Iran, particularly the Persian, because they're the majority in the country, giving up the national nationalism. So in the last days and rallies, we have some problems in this regard. We as Kurds, some of them even don't accept to use the name Jina. Jina is a Kurdish name. Say Maksa, why your name was Jina? And because the state re uh, rejected to re register her name Jina, they they were supposed to give her the name Maksa. So even some have problems to use the name Jina. And secondly, Jinjian Azadi is a is a Kurdish achievement. So this philosophy started in 94. Firstly, Jin Jian, uh, because the Kurdish, um, the root of Jin and Jian are the same in Kurdish women and life as philosophy. And, and then, then at, at least in on 24th of June 2013, when Ojalan wrote a letter to the Kurdish women's movement, said, "Well, life and women is okay, but you need to organize and to be more politically active, which means freedom. For freedom, you have to act, organ, be organized." So you see it okay, life and freedom is okay, but uh, you, uh, women and life are okay, but you need freedom and freedom is organizing, being politically active, leading mass movements. So that's the philosophy behind Jinjian Azadi. Even just taking the result, but not knowing the history behind is a kind of problematic. So, and I would say many of the Kurdish women who are now uh, leading this process, have been watching to the revolution in Rojava because Rojava could survive uh, against Turkish uh, aggression, against the support of global players for Turkey. And this can happen also in Iran. What is our duty as those uh, outside of Iran is helping them to come together, the Ahwas, the Kurds, the Belarus and the Persians, because system change have to be done internally, domestically in Iran. And there's a dynamic. What we should do is supporting them without being manipulated by the mainstream media. So why there's a need just to make a system change in Iran through military? Uh, so there's a, there's a dynamic already happening. People are asking for civil liberties, for democracy, for women's freedom. And we have to fully support them and also being critical to any kind of nationalism amongst these components, whatever the Kurds, Persians, Awad, the Baluch. So we, uh, solidar international solidarity means to, to overcome the obstacles amongst these progressive forces. So it means uh, the Green Lab or the Social Alliance in, in Australia help, help them uh, to overcome nationalism. Because this is the main trap uh, when we speak, we can't just change the system when we come together. And we have the power in Iran. And I, I trust and believe in the power of the peoples of Iran. And I believe particularly in the power of the Kurdish women and the Kurds in Rojava, uh, Kurdistan, Iranian Kurdistan. But we need a helping hand. Uh, we, have, we have experience. We, we, we resisted against Iranian regime uh, in the last uh, 30. And there's a long history behind this. And currently, uh, the main uh, power of the Iranian Kurds, the party of Persia, uh, made a declaration to Iran, said, uh, you have to make a system change. There's no condition, without condition, you have to make a system change. We as Kurds will insist to continue to force you for a system change without using any military power. Uh, so this is very important, not creating a new war zone. So because this is very high risky for all of us, for the whole Middle Eastern region, region and then imagine what will happen if the Kurds would start the armed resistance against Iran now, the Peja. So because it has thousands of fighters inside of Iran. Uh, what will happen then? We will deepen the chaos in the region. So therefore, I think all of us progressive forces have to help the dynamic inside of Iran. We have, we have, we, we have to support the people on the ground. I would say, uh, to make it very clear and easy, so there's, there are global players who have, who have a pro plan for Iran, strategic plan, strategic plan, and Iran has its plan as a nation state. So these are two sides, then we must be the third side, people from the grassroots. So bringing together, networking with them, and being also in positive way critical to each other. If we see uh, moves of nationalism, uh, helping them to overcome this, and then I'm sure with the people's power, with the third power, we will be able to make a system change because I think uh, the regime can't go back. 
So a lot of things has changed and the regime is forced to make uh, things. And this is a good opportunity to help the people of Iran uh, to bring down or to make change in the system, not in the regime. Well, you see, um, it's a very interesting picture, the one we have from Rojava. Um, when Turkish military will, um, will be able to uh, weaken the Kurdish resistance, uh, then Rojava will be the next. So as I said, next to Iraqi Kurdistan, Rojava is uh, on, the, on the targeting list of Turkey. Nevertheless, the people with their enthusiasm of revolution, they're continuing with the project of social economy, also continuing with all the projects they start, they have followed up in, 10 year, in the last 10 years. They continue because they believe in their system, what they created. Um, they will continue, but the problem is uh, the issue of su su survive. survive. Uh, so that's why I said we are in critical, very, very critical um, moment now and in the next few months. And um, to offer uh, or to offer Rojava to continue with their fantastic model of um, the fantastic alternative. So we have to also do something to um, protect them for ethnic, from the threat of ethnic cleansing by the Erdogan regime. So nothing has changed in Rojava. Instead, people are continuing learning and adding new uh, ideas in, in, in environmental issues, also in social economy, also developing uh, the philosophy of coexistence of different ethnic groups and religion groups. And also the women's movement is deepening the experiences um, that because they understand themselves as the main, the red line of the revolution, so um, I would say Rojava is continuing deepening the experiences, implementing them. Uh, but by saying all the all the experience, all the revolution is now under threat uh, because um, Turkish militarism, Turkish aggression. I don't know who will achieve, who will succeed. So I don't know. Uh, depends on the Kurdish uh, resistance and also the uh, solidarity which the Kurds uh, I hope will have in the next uh, few months, much more than we have now. Simply, I would say yes, because uh, the 21st century, as uh, you know, I, I, I study a lot of Ocalan's books and I'm very inspired by his ideas and his analysis, particularly the analysis that this century, the 21st century, is a century of war between nation states and the civil society. So in democratic confederalism actually is a model which is just focused on the civil society, on the grassroots. So we see non-states taking care of us, even on their own citizens. And you see the domestic policy, the tax policy, things are changing a lot. And the, the war against Ukraine become now a new excuse to um, to take over, to, to get, take back uh, the democratic rights we had everywhere after the achievement uh, of the peoples of the uprisings of proletariat, feminism, in the past century. So they're taking back all those what we have fought for. So this is now happening everywhere. So that, that's why there's no guarantee for you in Australia or for those here. So the nation states, when you look in the military budget of the states, they're all increasing their military budgets. Just look in the states with their military budgets. You will, you will see there's increase. Then they ask them why for the, what for they need so much increase why they, there's a need to increase the military military budgets in the states. And and improving new military technology for what? Who are they going to fight against? So they don't use the conventional army, but who are they going to attack with the drones, with chemicals, with other methods, with 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 with, uh, with, uh, with uh, I, don't, I even don't know what they are doing. Um, in other places, but um, privatization, everything. So um, pr problem of food is coming up, particularly in Asia and Africa. There's everywhere turmoil, you see? And uh, so it's the right time that people take the responsibilities for self-determination. Self-determination self doesn't mean nation state. Uh, self-determination by the left must be also redefined. We have to, um, 
add something new to Lenin's definition of nation state, of self-determination. Self-determination is if you can take responsibility for the place where you live, for the profession you are following, for the religion, for the other different forms of identities. Self-determination forms of autonomies. And then unity amongst the autonomies is democratic confidence, is a stateless democracy, democracy without, without new borders, democracy without new hierarchies, democracy without centralization. So, um, and I think the war in Russia, Ukraine, it's, it's not our war. Like the first, the second war have been done on our behalf, the states used to say. But nobody asked us to attack Russia or Ukraine or Kurdistan or Libya. We don't know who's taking the decisions. We not. So if we are not part of this decision, then we have to say clearly we are against these decisions of militarization of the world. So they tried this also in the Middle East with the, with the, I must say clearly that the Islamic State, uh, the Daesh in Arabic, was a paramilitary force used by, by the Western, uh, Western global players to, uh, to create a new Afghanistan in the Middle East. Imagine what would happen if the Islamic State would uh, succeed to occupy Raqqa and Mosul, two parts of Kurdistan. Now we would have today a more worse Afghanistan in the Middle East. And then we have a center, you would have a center where they have recruited thousands of fighters. Why do you think NATO is keeping blind eye on Turkish uh, aggression in Syria, in the, in the occupied areas in Syria? Because Erdogan is recruiting thousands of IS uh, terrorists there in, in Idlib, in Azaz, in Bab, in Afrin, in Senegal, in Mississippi. So these paramilitary forces which Turkey is taking care, do you think the NATO don't know this or what? So this is a bomb against the people in their hands. So I, I just want to say, we have to look uh, very in wider form uh, about the militarization of the century, about coming up aggression and the increasing of military budgets. So all these force us to, f to look for alternative, the alternative of the peoples. And I would say, this is democratic confidence for Ukraine, for Russia, for Iran, for China, for everywhere. So it's a, it's a century of the grassroots. And democratic confederalism is a democratic self-ruling alternative. We have to learn to rule ourselves, to govern for our future. So and, uh, democratic confederalism, I would say, can be also option for Ukraine and Russia and everywhere. That's what I believe. Um, well, I agree. I mean, uh, the son of Shah uh, and also the um, self-made queen of Iran, Shah Banu in Paris, she's also using now the slogan Jinjian Azadi, but in Persian. And they say, with the monarchy, we will bring um, democracy to Iran. And we have seen what the Shah has done to the progressive forces in the 60s and 70s, killed all of them and thousands become uh, politicians in exile. So, uh, and also there's uh, another move, uh, movement from Iran, so the Mujahideen Khalq. So saying we are a little bit moderate Islam, but if you look in their structures, no single sign of democracy. Uh, so I think most of those who are in um, conflict with the regime, but uh, those who are not interested in system change, but regime change, the son, the son of Shah is saying, well, I will replace the mullahs, <laughs> but com but committing the same crimes in different forms, or the Mujahideen al or there are also some small Kurdish groups saying the same. Uh, so what is the perspective? If you look in their program, what what are the pro what are they suggesting for the coexistence of the of, of the uh, of the multi ethnic and multicultural, multi-religious reality of Iran. What they are suggesting for the women's liberation. What they are suggesting for economic a new uh, order. What they are suggesting Iran's role in Middle East and in globally. So it's nothing clear from their side, just changing the power. So one is going, the other one is coming, but this is not the thing what the Iranian people or the people in Iran and Kurdistan are asking for. They are asking very clear for freedom, nothing else. Freedom in which they can 
exist as, as the, with their own identical identical ethnicity. So whatever Kurds, Awas, Baluch, and also different, there are also Assyrians in Iran. There are also Jewish people in Iran. There are different wings of Islam in Iran. There are also Baha'is in Iran. Iran is a rich country of cultural, religion, and eth- ethnicity. So there is a need of a kind of democratic confederalism for Iran, which means each of the components whether uh, have, have need to have their uh, autonomy. I, I'm saying this without changing the borders, the state borders of Iran, but internally we need a model of kind of uh, union of federations, which can then turn to confederalism. So this is the best way for Iran. Nation state of Iran doesn't um, doesn't um, uh, fit for the for the reality of of a multi a pluralism uh, of cultural plural pluralism in Iran. And um, I think I I think I know from the history of Iranian uh, of Iranian state, but also the people. Uh, Iran has always a progressive dynamic inside the Kurds and other groups. If they can come together they must decide uh, what what should be the future of all them together so there is a need of coming together deciding together without listening to those uh, the shah the son of shah or the self-made queen shah banu or mujahideen khair or these very marginalized groups who don't have anything to do with iran just uh, speaking from the exile uh, just writing things so those who are listened by the people uh, they have to come together and lead the revolution you know a revolution without leadership can't uh, functioning. We have seen this in the Arab Spring. Uh, similar, thousands of people went in Cairo on the streets, but there was less of avant-garde of, of the leadership. Um, so people are ready for revolution. People are ready for demo- democracy. We shouldn't uh, sacrifice this golden opportunity for our own interests, for our own narrow-minded uh, ideologies. Uh, so coming together, finding compromises. So first, one one compromise can be happened by being anti-nationalist, by being anti-sexist, by being anti-religiousness. These three main pillars. Uh, in this, we have to find compromises to come together, being anti against these three uh, sicknesses of nation states: sexism, religiousness, and uh, nationalism. Uh, these are the only obstacles we have now, and I think uh, Iranian people, people in Kurdistan, Iran, uh, are advantaged because they have seen what happened in Iraq, what happened in Syria, what happened in Libya, if the people wouldn't uh, take uh, the responsibility to lead their own revolution. And they have seen what happened in Rojava, when people are united, they can take over and make the system change. So Rojava is an example for Iran also, I would say. 